Okay, so we're going to talk about Kirchhoff's Law, um, which is a way to help us evaluate the enthalpy at different temperatures. And so we sort of instinctually have some sense that the reactants and the products are going to change, the enthalpy involved with those is going to change based off the temperature. There's going to be some dependence off of it. And so um, here we start off with just the idea that if we have, you know, reactants going to products at some reaction, it doesn't really matter what the reactants or the products are, there's some enthalpy involved in that um, reaction. And so this could be a phase change, it could be using enthalpy information, it could be combustion, it doesn't really matter. We just know that there's an enthalpy involved with that reaction and it's gonna be specific to that temperature. But what happens when we, want to, when we want to know the enthalpy at a different temperature? And so here I've kind of formed this little cycle um, where we have this, this, the same reaction. Um, it's just at a different temperature. And so it will naturally have to have a different enthalpy um, for that process. And so what we can think about is that the idea that enthalpy is a state function. And so we can basically start in one corner of this cycle, go around the cycle and know that we have to, essentially since we're starting and stopping at the same point, the total energy change is going to be the same. And so we can say, okay, well, if we do that, we're going from reactants to products. We know that that's going to involve the enthalpy at that first temperature. And so we have the enthalpy of that first temperature. Anytime we're trying to go from um, products or reactants at different temperatures, we have to take into account the heat capacity rather than the enthalpy, or the, or the heat capacity is going to be involved. And so here we take the products at temperature one going to temperature two, we can use the heat capacity of the products going from those two, uh, between those two temperatures. Um, since we're going here from the products to the reactants, we're using the inverse, the negative of the enthalpy. And so we see the negative enthalpy at that second temperature. And then again, now that we're going from reactants to temperature two to the reactants at temperature one, we use the heat capacity again, except this time we flip this. And so um, if we add all of these processes together, like I said, because it's a state function, all of this is involving state functions, um, ultimately the chain, the total change should be zero. And so this is a nice way for us to isolate the enthalpy at the second temperature and sort of rearrange the rest of this so that it becomes a more usable form. And so uh, it's a little bit, that'll take some algebra, but here we have a way to see that um, the enthalpy at temperature two is equal to the enthalpy at the first temperature we take the difference of the heat capacities of the products and the reactants, and then we take into account the temperature change. And so if we actually use this, um, we're looking for the enthalpy. We know that the enthalpy of vaporization of water is going to be at 25 degrees is 44.01 kilojoules per mole. We're trying to estimate the enthalpy of vaporization of water at 100 degrees. Um, we're told that the molar heat capacity for water as a liquid is 75.29 joules per Kelvin mole, and for, uh, for gas is 33.58 joules per Kelvin mole. And so here we have the reaction, and so we're talking about enthalpy of vaporization of water, and so we're going from liquid to gas. And so at 25 degrees, we know that it's 44.01 kilojoules per mole, and we're trying to figure out what it, what it is at 100 degrees. And so just go back to our rule. We have our enthalpy at temperature one. We look at the change in heat capacities. And so this is from it being in the gas. This is, and then this is from it being oops, a liquid. And so we're doing products minus reactants in terms of the change in heat capacity. Um, and then we take into account the change in temperature, which is 100 minus 25 degrees. And so and we do all that math and we see that at the new temperature, it is uh, it takes 40.88 kilojoules per mole in order to um, evaporate um, 
liquid water into and, and make, make the gas form. And so this makes sense that it requires less energy to, um, to cause this change because we're at a higher temperature. And so this equation can then be used for any reaction um, as long as we're looking at, the, at it happening from one temperature to a different temperature.